My name is Tim. Annette is currently still in a podcast interview, but I think she will come also later. Um, I'm quickly going to give an overview of uh, what's going to happen in the next, I think we have like one and a half hours. You can already see a bit on my like uh, drawn slides, I don't like PowerPoint that much, um, like w what will be the, what will be essentially like the, the, uh, the content of, of this entire session. We have uh, lined up uh, as, like six, seven speakers, including me. Um, we are going to center all of these uh, talks around the Ethereum magicians and specifically we're going to talk about um, ERC proposals, so Ethereum requests for, com uh, for, for comments, right? So basically everything that didn't fit into uh, Annette and Tim Baiko's earlier session, I think like it was about two weeks, uh, two days ago, um, about the Ethereum core uh, roadmap. So how this works? Each speaker has roughly um, 15 minutes and then we have a usually like a five minute break where we can set up the next speaker um, and maybe there's even like time for questions, I guess. Um, we will have some talks about uh, timestamps in uh, Ethereum get logs from Ronan that just entered the room by chance. Uh, we will have some talks about uh, soulbound tokens, about music NFTs, about yeah, DSOC, uh, we will have two people speaking about um, the, the problems uh, in the Web3 music space, um, about content types in, in NFTs, and then we'll also have a, a very recent EIP, namely, I think it's for the domain separator in EIP 712. So, um, I, I wanna I wanna give a be, before like we start with the speakers I think I wanna I wanna give a, a quick talk myself though kind of kind of like my own lightning, lightning talk and and it, I want to make it about kind of this weird thing that the ERCs are which are essentially this like immutable um, contracts that are al almost like as immutable as uh, a transaction in Ethereum and uh, the problem that comes with it which is that like we don't really know how to upgrade them and you know throughout this whole year of you know bull market and, and everything especially in the uh, nft eco nft ecosystem i think um you know there, there was a there, there's starting to be this debate basically around like how can we actually do innovation with these uh, contracts if you cannot change them anymore right and so like what can we do about it and i've tried to kind of like express that where you know like this contract uh this 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 document this proposal that once you once you put it into the uh the final status then it's really like locked like this like this lock and we can't really unlock it anymore and so we have to find ways of like still upgrading it and that's that's what i i, I want to try to motivate that actually and i want to try to make like an optimistic case for why it's actually cool so uh, but first of all, I think we have to backtrack a bit, and, and this so this is a comment from, uh, I believe the the GitHub thread on EIP twenty six twelve the uh, the the permit standard that allows you basically it's like a replacement for EIP twenty tokens where instead of sending the approval on chain and like kind of like wasting all of this gas for the transaction envelope you. You technically could sign a transaction get, that gives the spending contract uh, the permission with your signature. And so the, the idea, I guess, would have been that new use cases are kind of enabled and that also um, that also we can save a lot of gas, especially like considering that, you know, each EIP20 transfer is essentially like two transfers, right, today. And so if we could already condense that to one, I think the gas savings would be uh, quite significant considering like how much we are transacting with EIP20 tokens. So this comment is actually cri a critique though on that standard and basically it, I, I don't even like fully know the entire history but I know that I think the, the standard has like some issues, it's not really in, in final mode either and then 
you know, like many uh, companies have like kind of diverged from it and, and they're like non-compliantness, like I think with this standard. So it kind of shows, I think, maybe uh, a, a, a bear, bearish case for, for this kind of um, uh, uh, standardization approach. And then um, the other case, which I had to deal with myself uh, personally, because I, I uh, crawl NFTs, uh, this is the interface for the Zora uh, M NFT contract, and M stands for media NFT. And, you know, I, I think my first exposure to this was that I was kind of like, disappointed because essentially when you call the token URI, like the regular token URI, you are expecting a JSON. And, uh, but what I'm getting back is a media file. And so I have to actually have to actually go to the token metadata URI. And that's where the metadata is, right? I mean, the name is descriptive of that. And, and so I was a bit disappointed because I couldn't, like, I had to basically build like this, uh, this like custom logic around it. But on the other hand, I'm also emp empathetic with that because uh, in the regular NFT, the media file, which has been like traditionally the image, is literally in a uh, JSON object that we call metadata. So, the, I, I mean, in my opinion, that says a lot about how we think about NFTs and that we see the image or like the media that is attached to the NFT kind of like as metadata to something that is the NFT that is kind of like a, maybe like a financial instrument then or whatever. And so I, I think it's actually beautiful that they, that, you know, that they made the case that we should actually use the token URI to embed the media file directly and to center really the NFT around the media file and not uh, make the media file a mere... Uh, metadata field so yeah um, and apart from all of this uh, like pessimism I think there's there's another good reason for uh, submitting and, and and being active on this forum and it's because you get a ton of exposure to uh, to your ideas so this is a, a thread here that I made I think around in in April and it's about uh, like a specification for soul bound tokens or we now call them account bound tokens and this thread has gotten 9000 views and if you would sort by the replies it's actually the top uh, <laughs> the top controversial thread on the entire forum for the for the entire year apparently so i mean while, while that is uh, concerning to me because apparently uh, a lot of people have opinions about this uh, it's also on the other hand it was a, like a beautiful chance of, of receiving feedback and also co like of, of receiving constructive feedback uh, with, which, with which without that, this standard wouldn't, wouldn't have gone where, where it went today. So I initially started this um, as a non-transferable token uh, specification and basically now we have, can, we have like moved into consensual minting um, and into like, yeah, basically like having the, the signature being checked by both the sender and the receiver. And, you know, we are actively talking about all of the privacy challenges of soulbound tokens. And so this has really become basically like a, a space where this entire standard, all the soulbound token things, everything is like very verbosely documented. And, and I, I think it's awesome because I, I wouldn't have had these idea, ideas by myself. So I think this is like a community effort and it's cool. Um, and so, by the way, I'm like, basically these slides are all a um, Eve Magician's blog post, essentially. And uh, I need to find a bit my way. But so, the, so, so basically one of the, but kind of like one of the, one of the problems of the EIP uh, standards process is that it's, it, it's, it's truly permissionless and it's open to everyone essentially because you, you can just go to like the, uh, you know, like github.com slash ethereum slash EIPs and you can submit your own EIP and as long as you are uh, complying to the, uh, the formatting rules and you're like, you know, you're, you're like um, receptive to the, to the feedback of the EIP editors and you're not like mean to them or whatever, you, you will actually get your document merged and that document will show up on eips.ethereum.org. So that's really cool. Um, and that's really a strength, but it's also a weakness. And I think this, uh, I, I guess it's like a bit of a famous uh, cartoon in the, 
in the uh, in the standards uh, community at least where you know like this like the this xkcd comic uh, you know where there's like 14 competing standards for a use case and then there's this one guy saying hey that's cr crazy like why do we need 14 standards we should have one standard that has all of the uh, that, that addresses all of the use case and suddenly we have like 15 standards right so so it's kind of a problem in the erc process as well that we just have like a lot of verbosity and and and, and duplication and 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 so on so it's like you know on one side we have like the strength the openness and also this like uh yeah, it's almost like a spam problem or whatever but i want to i want to i want to still motivate and i want to i want to say that i th i find this actually awesome and I find it awesome because I think that there's a difference between a, a temporarily emergent consensus and a consensus that is more like spontaneous and probably like from this kind of like, uh, you know, like group or, or a committee of experts. And so I, I've tried to visualize that with the two different kind of approaches, the, the two different extremes, so to say, where, you know, on one side we have more like a market-driven adoption where the individual kind of... Uh, makes the decision by themselves, they, they do all of the due diligence and, and they come to the conclusion that they want to use a standard. And then on the other hand, um, and this is maybe true for, um, yeah, like more, uh, I think like groups that have to make decisions rather quickly and, and, and like, uh, yeah, like close to time, I think you have this, basically this, this, this spontaneous committee consensus where, you know, 51% can basically overrule the, uh, forty nine percent and i and i want to make uh, I, I just want to uh, kind of make this argument that you know i I believe that the temporarily uh, continuously emergent consensus is actually the the cooler one the the one that has like a that ends up having like a stronger signal over time and that's because i i mean there's one hacky way of just like proving that and that's uh, that if you consider like how organizations are run today then it's probably mostly in like this 51% cons con consensus style, right? And then on the other side, you have this totally chaotic, evolutionary kind of thing that, that is the market that somehow also figures out like what is the best decision, but completely different and not by talking to each other. And so I, I think, and I mean, by no means is this uh, financial advice, but I, I would always bet on the market and not on like an individual uh, uh, committee actually. And, and so I, I think that's that's actually the better uh, the better approach, and 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 also I mean I, I guess it's also the reason why like m much of our critical infrastructure is like run in that way. Like I don't think there's like a you know like a central planning for the food network in a city or, or stuff like that. Um, and so so the question is though like. How how can we overcome this this uh, this immutability of of contracts and how can we actually still innovate on those standards and and this is especially true with uh, with all of the like this uh, you know all of the eyeballs that that have have like went into the NFT space and and you know kind of this difficulty of 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 innovating with the standard and and I mean sadly also with uh, being non-compliant to the standard and just trying to grow. Uh, ex externally from standards and and so I think immutability does not necessarily mean uh, stagnation I, I think actually there is now we are starting to see a pattern emerge where people are starting to really upgrade the standard and they are doing it in a way where they are basically like um, yeah bolting basically bolting um, kind of this one lock to the other almost like a uh, like like in a I don't know on these bridges that sometimes you can see as a tourist kind of thing. So, so I think um, over the last half a year that has really happened. So, uh, for example, we now have a standard uh, event for emitting a uh, an event when the metadata is updated in an in an NFT standard, and that's uh, the one on the uh, top right. It's the 4906. That essentially just emits an event. We now have a very uh, interesting standard for, that basically splits the user and the owner into two different groups. And I think, especially with you know with DSOC 
kind of making us aware that there are only that, that, that there are like subsets of ownership where kind of ownership represents this bucket of right and then you know you can have fructus and you can have usus and up, up usus and so on um, this this is starting to become really really interesting right where we have like different uh, kind of roles that could interact with the NFT and then this could have uh, like different ec economies and so that's I want to give a shout out that's uh, 4907 and then I, I guess maybe like a, a more infamous one is the is the royalties one uh, uh, and it's the uh, 2981 and that's basically an, an optional uh, an, an, an optional roy royalties allocation mechanism for NFTs that is implemented, I think, in uh, in many NFT marketplaces. And 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 again, I, I just want to highlight that I think it is definitely possible to upgrade uh, these things, and like we are we are doing that. I just think that probably the time horizon that we're looking at this, and where you know we're like drawn to being a bit more pessimistic. I think maybe we or. I mean, personally, maybe I have to be more patient and just like trust in the process. And um, yeah, I guess I have five more minutes. So I'm also gonna, uh, of course, I'm gonna shill a, uh, a standard that I did myself, which is the minimum uh, soulbound token. And it works in the exact same way where basically we are extending and even breaking the EIP721 interface. And essentially uh, we're allowing people to lock an NFT so you can uh, emit a locked event and an unlocked event depending on whether the uh, transfer function should be uh, re should be reverting or not and then we also have this uh, view function that allows you to always check whether a token is locked and and the purpose for this is that um, that if you were if you were to just use like the plain um, 721 standard which Actually, it has a kind of like a small uh, line in it where it says like that these uh, NFTs can also be they can be used as a read like a re read only reg registry. The problem is that indexers and wallets and so on wouldn't really recognize it because uh, a computer cannot reason from let's say you know the transfer is reverting to you know this thing is like locked because it could also be that you have done like something else like something something else wrong you know and so therefore the error might be referring to something else. So I, I personally think that's useful and that's final now also, and it's building on uh, uh, 721. Yeah, I, I mean now I'm at uh, 17 minutes. The next we're, we're uh, gonna have the next speaker. Um, thank you for also giving me the chance to give this little talk, and um, I want to uh, ask to stage uh, Ronan Wigger Waga. <laughs> I don't know the exact pronunciation. Thank you. Okay, thank you for coming here. Um, so, uh, so I, it's a, here I want to present a very simple proposal and kind of to explain it, I wanted to show a demo and I wanted to show it in real time, but the Wi-Fi made me, so, made me realize that I should probably uh, have it already done and show you the result. Um, so basically the proposal is to improve. So what I'm building, uh, I'm building a indexer so that kind of take all the event of a contract and construct the state, which is our most uh, smart contract system handle state for the client, for, yeah, for basically having um, data about it. And, and most projects use a backend, which is at odds with uh, the vision of, of decentralized application. So here my idea was simply, let's index in the browser. And of course, uh, it doesn't work for everything. Um, because of the scale of some of these of these systems. So for example, if you wanted to index all the NFT, uh, you could do it in the browser, but it will take a while. Um, but for some other case, it actually worked very well. Um, and so I was doing, so I have this game. So the whole state of the game is actually here. Uh, so you have all the fleet. Uh, so it's kind of it's a game in space. You have planet and fleets. Uh, it kind of has the two main things. and it's like, I think this state is around seven megabytes, but it's not actually, I didn't implement a full. Uh, so I have an index, I have the same indexer running on the graph. Um, and I didn't finish to implement it fully here. So I expect maybe to get to 20 megabytes of state. 
um, and I can on a normal network. I don't know what normal means, but uh, it kind of it took five seconds to think the whole thing. And if you can obviously, um, uh, but I made an assumption that uh, in my in my game there is this notion of time. So every event, um, so the state the the contract will kind of lazily update per time, and I think it's quite a common thing in, in smart contract. And unfortunately, when you fetch the logs, which is the mechanism by which you index and manage to get back the state, all these events basically, which um, you don't have access to the timestamp at which they happen. It just, for some reason, uh, they didn't thought to add that. So there is a block hash, the block number, uh, but there is no block timestamp. And so my game actually, when I, uh, I need the timestamp. Uh, and so, so because I don't have the timestamp in the logs, I get like 20,000 event here. And what I need to do then, I need to request 20,000 times um, depending, I mean, a bit less because you can have uh, same event, uh, an event in the same block, but you, I have to request that on top. And because it's a in-browser indexer, it uses EIP11993, which is like the, the wallet interface, and I cannot do batch request. I have to do uh, all these requests. And so uh, I have this version. We actually, is still running from last time, and sometimes you error out because uh, the RPC is not happy that time. So the RPC of MetaMask, because again here, it's just a static web page. There is nothing, no backend, um, and it all only rely on the fact that the user have a, have a EIP 1193 wallet. In that case, it's MetaMask, and if you, if you look at my settings, it's actually an RPC uh, somewhere else. But, uh, so it, it's still querying all of this to get the timestamp, while the other one have been finished a long time ago, and only actually, you see 580 requests, it's actually 300 because the other one now is just uh, to get the latest block and nothing is really happening in that game right now. Um, while this one is still like fetching the, the state. So uh, it's going to reach probably 20,000 to sync or maybe even more. Um, um, yeah, so, that, that, so the proposal, I wanted to show you a kind of a, a really example, but the proposal is, um, is basically to add this to the, the JSON object. So it's a very simple change you can do uh, in, a, in your node. So in Go Ethereum or what, whatever. And so actually, funnily enough, uh, like Tim pushed me to go to the core dev uh, meeting the other day. And actually I'm going to, and so we had an interesting discussion about it. But um, so I kind of, so most of it I already say, but the idea is that uh, you must, so what I could do is that I could add the timestamp to the to the event itself, uh, but obviously when you do your contract, you know that there, there is a block information, so there is no need to add the timestamp to the event. It's just a waste of gas. Um, and time is an important aspect of many smart contracts, and block number cannot be a replacement for them. And the reason why is because uh, block number timings can change across chains, but they, we, also there is no guarantee that a single chain will not keep it. And you could probably emulate uh, an average block time using smart contract itself, but it's, it's kind of a, a ugly workaround. Um, and block, block time stamps are already easily available, like the block hash or the block number. And the, uh, another, uh, so I've been discussing about uh, a few people with us, and some, yeah, but this is extra data you have to put in, in the log object. Uh, but it's small, and the alternative is to to fetch all of these anyway. Um, so of course, for the one who don't care about timestamp, then they, they have an extra uh, uh, small, but I feel it's small enough. Um, I also consider alternative, but I would not consider them as alternative, actually, I could consider them as complementary. Uh, so when I mention them, I'm not saying I don't want them, actually I want them, um, but I feel they, they, they will not replace Thank you. Um, so yeah, basically one alternative is to add batch, um, a batch API for EIP1193. Okay. It was actually part of the conversation initially, but it was dropped. Uh, but I think it's, it's a valid one to have. And, but my opinion, it doesn't offer the same advantage as having the block timestamp in the log. Um, and another EIP that I didn't see it yet uh, is to have a Gra GraphQL API 
So basically an alternative to EIP 1193. And with GraphQL, you can ask what you want, which make it more efficient as well uh, for transferring data. So if you don't care about the timestamp, you don't need. Uh, and actually this one could really, by actually solving the, the first one. So this one is really an alternative, but I, I don't see any reason to just um, add the other one. Especially I think GraphQL is not supported uh, in all the node implementation today. Um, and so, so, as I say, I went to the core dev and we had the feedback. And the main feedback was that hey, there is no point to do it because we are going to make uh, the logs uh, not being accessible after a certain time. And so the argument was like, you will never have that many logs. And so requesting the timestamp anyway won't matter. Uh, and so my reply is that, uh, so it's an easy change. Uh, so my next action will be to make a PR, I guess, for Go Ethereum, um, and uh, and the number of logs actually can still be significant. Um, so even if we remove past log, we still want to to have access to them. But actually, the main issue with that with that uh, feedback is that we need to really think how we are going to solve ac the state access about um, if we we don't have access to past logs how do we are going to index uh, in a decentralized manner? Um, because of course, if you have a backend, you know, you solve your problem, but we, we don't want to have a backend, right? You want to be able to use Tornado Cache from your browser without relying, re with only relying on your node. Uh, and so, so I think, I don't know, for me that I would like to, to have discussion as a community how we can so, solve that. Like, um, I know there is work on the, uh, Around, like right now, but portal, I think it's portal network. Um, and so, but I think it's important we, um, we understand like the point of view of application developer that don't want to be involved with our application once it's launched. Um, and um, another thing, yeah, so I mentioned like most systems already rely on the log event, so we, we need uh, this system anyway. And even some EIP have been using it to kind of speed up the, the need or kind of lim minimize the gas cost, which is EIP 1155. Like you can't query the balance of all the tokens that the user owns from the smart contract. And so you allow the smart contract to be more efficient. Uh, and it's because it has been the result of everybody acknowledging that we use logs and events to reconstruct the state. Um, but that, interestingly, in the, one of the things about the, in the CORDEV meeting was that that was not the vision initially. But now we evolve, we understand what we need. And so I think, yeah, that I, I, I will end with, uh, with like, yeah, let's discuss about how to solve this, being able to rebuild uh, the state from, from the client. It's kind of all for me. Yeah, any question? Thank you. Thank you, Ronan. Thank you. Hand of applause. Uh, do, so we have, uh, we have time for questions. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, what are your thoughts on using getters in the contract? What are your thoughts on using getters in the contract as opposed to events to get the data for a UI? Yeah, so, so for, I, I can talk about my game actually on that front. So the first version, I really wanted to launch the first version without any backend. So the first version of the game, the first alpha, uh, I, I didn't have an indexer using the log and I was fetching all the data. And it's, it's not actually, it's not efficient either because uh, especially list of things and and you are wasting gas to support that in many cases. Like, so this is uh, what I, why I mentioned EIP 1155, not having access to the balance. And we could also think about um, you know, 7 to 1 um, enumerable extension, which add actually a lot of gas cost overall. Um, so, I, and I think from what we have seen, everybody like even to, to do that role. So I think, that's what we should do and minimize the role of the, of, yeah, minimize the gas cost. We, basically, that's what we want. We minimize the things that happen on the chain if we can do it off chain, but this assume we have a system to retrieve it. That's why I think it's important to discuss uh, because maybe the conclusion is like, oh, actually we cannot and we have to pay gas to do that, but I hope it's not the case. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start my timer, so I have a reference point here. Uh, yeah, this is my first time actually talking at DevCon. This is my second DevCon. Um, and I'm super happy to be contributing back and sharing knowledge and uh, sparking debate and ideas. So thanks for having me. And thanks, Tim, for organizing this as well, Annette. <coughs> So today I wanted to talk about uh, EIP 4973, uh, badges, and definancializing DAOs and beyond as well. Uh, so firstly, a little bit about me. My name is Rahul. I'm co-founder of this little baby company that we started called Order Space. Uh, and uh, I've been in the crypto ecosystem since 2016. I started off with uh, my journey also with music. Uh, I was building NFTs to assetize music royalties back in 2017. Did not work. Uh, then moved on to SoundCloud, got FOMO with DAOs, and I got back to crypto full-time now. <laughs> um, so I think I want to start with uh, how this year had started, actually. Like, uh, uh, we think that there was this paper called Decentralized Society, uh, and it centered our attention on this notion that Web3 centers around uh, expressing transferable financial assets rather than encoding social relationships of trust. Uh, when everything is transferable, uh, things can be sold to the highest bidder. So, you know, we wanted to challenge that. Uh, and that's, that's what that problem is what gave to this idea uh, and working with Tim on this uh, EIP, uh, what we call uh, account bound tokens. Uh, not to be confused with soulbound tokens, or you may be, uh, but uh, semantically speaking, we kind of uh, you can define this as non-transferable tokens bound to an account. Uh, and then our goal here was to really, it's very semantic based again, like to kind of create special ownership deeds or creating like permission primitives, but really to create a new ownership experience uh, through this primitive. You can read more about this. Uh, uh, we have uh, written a more extensive uh, article on this. Uh, however, ever since we started, we saw, we noticed this account bound tokens uh, debate had kind of like exploded. You know, there's soul bound tokens, there was community bound tokens, ENS name bound tokens, now human bound tokens. Uh, what we're actually seeing is this non-transferable tokens is a spectrum. And you, you can define what is being bound to and what is that binding strategy. And you can kind of, uh, this, is, this is where the explosion of ideas are coming. And as a builder, I feel like some of the NFT, uh, NFT spec is kind of over-optimized for what we actually express our ideas through. So we're kind of like craving for new tools and new, uh, new instruments to kind of like... Uh, uh, build our ideas, right? And at Order Space, we we call something smaller, something simpler. We call them badges, uh, which is powered by EIP four nine seven three account bound tokens. <clears throat> so uh, I want to dive right into it, like because because. Uh, Ever since soulbound tokens was kind of like really a hot topic, it kind of sparked like a lot of hot debates. Or uh, and it's it's debates are great, like because uh, it really helped us intellectually navigate the space and like get like a pluralistic opinion uh, from various uh, parties. Uh, one of the first things uh, or concerns they put out, like I think, was permanence. You know, what if I don't want a soulbound token or an account bound token? You know, anymore. And the second one is a lack of consent. What if I get uh, an NFT like that's non-transferable airdrop to me with my uh, personal details? You know, what would what would happen? You know, and key rotation. You know, like I, I, what if I lose access to my key wallet, or I want to like I mean uh, to my wallet, or I want to change my wallet? And lastly, this more popular active debate about like uh, verifiable credentials and ABTs on chain versus off chain identity. Uh, so lots of things. Uh, very simply put, uh, there we've written again lots of uh, detail on this, but I can kind of summarize this. Uh, these were the design decisions that helped us do, uh, input into EIP four nine seven three. So permanence, when we talk about uh, in general, what we baked into it is uh, burning and dissociation from the so, so the owner of the soul bound token or account bound token can dissociate from uh, uh, from the token itself, and then lack of consent. Uh, it, 
non-transferable tokens through account-bound tokens cannot be airdropped. You need to have uh, two-way consent, which I will dive into a little bit later. And with order space, we're actually uh, actively looking into uh, recovery mechanisms, like community-based recovery, especially if you lose access and you have all these non-transferable tokens. Uh, and lastly, AVTs versus verifiable credentials. Use both, really. It's not mutually exclusive. Uh, they have like uh, good use cases, and it's really we're in the early stages of uh, kind of like the debate and application. So I'm kind of excited of well, what would actually come out of this uh, next year. Uh, so like on a very high level, like I'm oversimplifying this, but like you can see the key differences. Like if you look at like various uh, angles or various uh, dimensions, right? If you look at transferability, consent, removal, issuance, uh, expiration, and fungibility. But I think uh, I want to bring focus to where consent and issuance. Uh, that's that's really what we wanted to like did not want to compromise on the, when it came to uh, non-transferable token design. So let's dive right in. Like, so this is the ERC4973. At a glance, you can just npm install that. Very easy. Uh, so that's a very, uh, very light uh, interface, right? Like, it just uh, expresses. So we can kind of like dive into what this uh, actually does. So firstly, this top section, right? This transfer event balance of owner of. This is this was mainly to ensure backward compatibility backward compatibility to NFT in general. So we actually implement the IERC uh, 721 MM metadata. Uh, so one of the things so that building this EIP actually it was super uh, amazing learning experience. Uh, we actually didn't have the transfer event first, and then we were kind of missing all this stuff like Etherscan was not showing the log events, for example, or MetaMask was not showing the uh, the, the, the interesting metadata. So we we actually started using the transfer event, which is such a simple change. Everything started working automatically, you know, like uh, the support, the interoperability actually came uh, came for free, and that that's one of the reasons we we went back to the transfer event. Although in a non-transferable event uh, uh, token, you can argue that transfer has no uh, makes no sense. But uh, this was one of the design decisions that we learned, like to kind of ensure backward compatibility. Uh, and the next one, and this is really the, where the consent really comes into play. So if you see the function, there's like three three parameters, right? Like the from, the URI, and the signature. So we call this a take flow. Uh, so you cannot actually mint an account-bound token unless it's two parties involved. So it's like a peer-to-peer, -peer, fully mutually consented protocol, right? So you can think about this as like, okay, Alice designs an ABT described by a spec which is hosted by the token URI. Alice then wants to issue the ABT to Bob. Uh, Alice can only do that if this if if she signs using EIP seven twelve signature and provide that's capturing her consent. So now that one party consent is established, Bob can now take the SBT. He he would then basically authenticate by providing the token URI, the signature, and from Alice, and then prove that I can take this. Uh, so this is uh, in auto space. We actually call this the allow list flow. So I'm just like adding people to an allow list. I'm like signing uh, people uh, for to a badge. And the t give flow is actually it's inverse. Uh, it's uh, it's when the when Alice designs an ABT, Bob wants the ABT, so signs it, and then Alice can now give the ABT to Bob. So this in auto space we call it. Uh, the airdrop flow. So if you if you give a badge, you can just like basically I want this, and 100 people say I want this. You can actually do an airdrop through uh, through a, an account bound token. And the last bit is this one. It's uh, the unequip. This basically means complete dissociation from the account bound token. So only the owner of the token can dissociate. So they, these are like basically the fundamental building blocks that kind of like help this uh, create this. Very bare minimum, uh, very simple, very highly functional, highly utilitarian uh, EIP for 973. And then auto space, we are kind of like uh, building more flavors or more layers around it. But this, uh, all the uh, what this had served at the fundamental has been working really good for us so far. And I also co uh, actively contribute to the EIP, and uh, yeah, and it's been super exciting and learning in general. So moving on to the other side of what the, the topic I wanted to chat about as well, which is definancialization, right? At Autospace, we're like, the badges, we see this in like sig 
six areas how we can use a non-transferable token. A membership model, non-financial rewards uh, and recognition, onboarding quests to end with the badge, uh, assess the reputation, uh, more nuanced governance models, and then unlock access permissions of these badge holders. But I want to bring attention to this bit. This bit of uh, that's non-financial uh, rewards and recognition. I mean, I think we can all agree that uh, the ecosystem is like hyper financialized uh, and we want to challenge that status quo. Like, you know, you, if you're in a position of wealth and influence, you can buy tokens. And if your community is basically to design their governance on a one token, one vote system, so person of influence can basically assert their entire influence through that power. So it's basically plutocracy, right? So. We want to challenge that and we want to move towards more towards the one human, one vote. But uh, for us, we see the one account, one vote as a necessary step to kind of get to one human, one vote. Uh, and then this is really fresh off the grill, right? This happened like a few days ago. Uh, the mango market, uh, the hacker exploited mango for 100 million. Hacker turns around, uh, <laughs> offers to return the funds. And he used 32 million of those votes to say yes to his own proposal because he hacked those and then executed that proposal. <laughs> and I think we can do better than this, right? Like, uh, it's a, it's, it's a no-brainer, I feel. But it's really, the takeaway that I wanted to kind of uh, here, have here is uh, let's move away from the one token, one vote system uh, and away from plutocracy. And uh, I think uh, let's, let's, let's explore new forms of governance. I think there's no one size fits all. Uh, I think we are in a stage where the ecosystem is growing so so fast, and we as builders, we we definitely need more uh, instruments at our toolkit. We need to spark debate, uh, apply rigor, get feedback. So uh, I'm glad that I'm kind of like uh, getting a lot of that here in DevCon. So that's uh, that's a lot. That's it, and that's a Dali author. We are. Uh, we don't work, we just create these DALI orders most of the time. Uh, we are uh, surprising, my team is surprisingly good at creating DALI orders. Uh, you can scan this, uh, it'll give you more information about us. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. For me. Thank you, thank you, Raul. Um, we have some time left, three minutes. Do we have questions? Ah, yes, okay. Hey, um, can you elaborate a bit on the account, uh, the, sorry, the recovery part? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so well, one of the things with account recovery, uh, it actually came up pretty actively in the debate. Like, hey, if I have badges in my account, if you have non-transferable tokens, what if I want to rotate my keys? Uh, then how do I do this? And that's one of the criticisms that were pointed at soulbound tokens in the initially. Uh, quite frankly, I feel this is a this is not a soulbound problem or soulbound token problem. This is a, a entire protocol uh, Ethereum problem, and I feel like we need to wait until we need to do this better, and then we can ab absolutely adopt it. But we are looking at two ways of recovery. One is a proactive recovery and a reactive recovery. But we are offloading this to the community in our protocol, at least. So it's basically like moving from moving your phone, like if you're import, you're porting your number. Uh, from one phone to the other. So you're actually doing a proactive action. So you have to kind of like prove that you are the owner of this account and the account that you're porting over to. But the way we're thinking about this is uh, you can't transfer these tokens, but you can burn all the tokens as the owner of the current account, and you can get it reissued through the, the, the issuing authority, which is generally the communities or DAOs. Uh, the other aspect is reactive recovery, which is where like I lost everything, uh, then, you know, it's, that's a tricky one. You have to establish with your, uh, like your DAO, for example, that, hey, I'm the same person behind this new wallet. Like you have to reissue uh, it. And one of the models we are looking at there is reissuance, but the community perhaps can revoke those badges. Uh, so that's, that's how we're kind of thinking about it. Thanks. More, more questions? We have time for one more question. Hey, here. Ah, that's okay. Um, uh, just quick thing uh, regarding um, re uh, recovery through burning and then reissuing. It would be awesome if there was a way to do that atomically. Yes, so that, yeah. right. um, but the other question was, what is the status of the EIP? Is there time to still make 
breaking changes uh, or is it already like so widely adopted and this kind of relates to the stagnation uh, thing, discussion but i think it's yeah that's a good question i should have actually uh, put the stats on it i mean uh, people are already using it uh, we've seen uh, i don't know maybe like uh, 150 300 hits on probably somewhere on github so we are actively thinking about backward compatibility when we're adding but the eip is in review stage at the moment uh, yeah when and now we're at kind of talking about expiration uh, as a uh, as to be baked into a badge where you can give like a 30 day expiration badge for example especially if you're like uh, joining a DAO, you get guest badge for example you know you can do some interesting action so an expiring badge is something we're looking at but uh, yeah like we are this is one of the forums we're hoping to get feedback on like you know where should we park it should we get feedback or have invest in extensions and like because uh, there's a lot of utility this can deliver in its current form you know, and then uh, it would be uh, uh, strange to perhaps like, you know, uh, stretch this timeline because I think uh, I've seen AIPs go for years. <laughs> thank, thank you, Raul. Uh, applause, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm just gonna, while, while the next speaker, Sweetman, is um, going to set up the, uh, the laptop and so on, I'm just gonna w uh, walk you through the rest of our timetable, which is, by the way, here. So, uh, next up is uh, Sweetman.eth, and he's gonna talk about uh, music, the music NFT engineer. Uh, then we have Andres, who's going to talk about uh, Web3, the Web3 music NFT multiplayer problems. I'm very excited about that. I think it's uh, like it comes out of uh, water and music research. Uh, then we have Ian, who is going to talk about uh, rich content types in NFTs. And then finally, we have Francisco, who is going to talk about a uh, like a very recent EIP called uh, 5267. Uh, I think which uh, uh, I think it defines the domain separator of EIP uh, 712. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you're familiar with that, I guess it's you, you kind of understand what it is. If not, then uh, I recommend going to eips.ethereum.org and reading up on it. Um, uh, yeah, okay. I do have a lot of music NFTs for y'all today. So first, I'll ask a couple questions. Who has a music NFT? <laughs> okay. Who owns any NFTs on Optimism? Who owns NFTs on Arbitrum? Who owns NFTs on Polygon? My goal is by the end of this, you will have your hand up for all of those. Hi, I'm Sweetman Dadi, aka the Music NFT Engineer, and today we're going to talk about music metadata. First, the problem, you're going to see QR codes throughout this. The ones on that side are from musicians in Latin America. If you want to support creators here in Latin America, scan that, buy the NFT, support local creators. On this side, you'll see CC0 music NFTs, 100% free mint, on different chains. And so they'll be scattered throughout. If you want some NFTs, mint them. The problem, and don't worry, the same QR codes are going to be a little bit hidden in here. Music platforms are not creating music NFTs. This is a very spicy take that I like to hold. You'll see on the, your left side, these are metadata from the top NFT platforms. Up top, you've got Zora, Creator. In the middle, you've got Catalog. And down at the bottom, you've got Sound. You'll notice that they each have different metadata. But honestly, there's no real differentiation between the metadata of a music NFT and a normal NFT in most cases. Over here on this side, you'll see the music metadata standard. This includes the same attributes as a normal NFT in addition to attributes that matter for music, attributes like lossless audio, attributes like BPM, attributes like duration. These are things that matter when we're talking about platforms like Spotify or Zora wanting to index these NFTs and to be able to differentiate between a music NFT and a normal NFT. Why does this matter? When we talk about Ethereum, congrats, we're in the Ethereum Wizards room. We have merged. And so now the next kind of goal in our identity crisis as a community is how do we get global adoption? I see music NFTs as the Trojan horse for Ethereum adoption. While a lot of people don't care about NFTs, most people do care about music. 
And so if we can build platforms that allow music NFTs to plug seamlessly into the existing infrastructure, we can allow for more and more people to be consuming the Ethereum technology that we know and love. But the big challenge right now is that musicians are using these platforms that don't really differentiate metadata between normal NFTs and music NFTs. Next, the opportunity. Another set of NFTs. Oh yeah, the last one. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't shout out the creator. So the last creator, this first NFT is Caspiel. We've got Columbo in the audience, um, manager of Caspiel. And so that NFT is from a musician named Caspiel who dropped on Zora Creator. And that is a music video of her latest music video, Reflejo. And uh, all of my music NFTs are CC0 from a musician named Sagrado based out of Mexico. My favorite, because he does everything CC0. This next one, over here we've got another Zora NFT. Um, I think we've got Tranky in the audience who helped a Buenos Aires creator named, uh, well, created a platform called Unun. And so if you scan this, it'll take you over to Unun to mint some music NFTs from local Buenos Aires creators. And this one is another one from Sagrado. And this one, I believe, is on Polygon. Last one was Optimism. This one's on Polygon. The opportunity. We have an opportunity right now to standardize music metadata. Right now, it's been in discussions. You might have heard about Telegram groups. You might have heard about different chats that are scattered amongst the music NFT ecosystems. Maybe you've talked with HiFi Labs about their music NFT standards. Maybe you've talked with Zora. There's a lot of different standards out there. We have not really reached consensus, and I find that awesome because there's no gatekeeper. There's nobody that's telling us this is how it is. It's very much a bottom-up. What does each creator want to use when they're making their music NFTs? Um, and again, the full music metadata standard over there on this other side. How you can help. Again, the music metadata standard is not something that we're going to have Sony or Warner or some record label is going to come down and say, this is how it is. It's going to be bottom up from the engineers that are building, from the creators that are choosing what platforms to build on. Each of us as individuals is choosing which memes we want to propagate in order to make the, mess, the best metadata win. The final set of NFTs we've got, this is a catalog NFT from a creator named Hey Bella, who is also based here in Colombia in Medellin. And this one is an Arbitrum NFT, the same NFT um, by Sagrado. Spread the memes. All the Ethereum wizards, all of you builders, we are building. Um, it's important that we propagate proper music metadata when we're building. If we're giving these musicians poor metadata, we're setting them up for failure in the long term. As Spotify, as iTunes, as these other big platforms, the Future Tapes, the Spin Amps, are indexing music NFTs. If we're not putting beats per minute, if we're not putting keys, if we're not putting the credits on chain, we're missing out. And so what I've been working on is I cloned the Zora Metadata Render, which is an architecture that allows us to decouple the ERC721, the ERC1155, all the tokens we know and love from the metadata that they represent. And so we have a full music metadata standard that's fully on chain, deployed on Ethereum mainnet, Polygon mainnet, Optimism mainnet, Arbitrum mainnet, as well as test nets for all those chains. It's live, the contracts are verified, it's fully running on a platform that I built called Decent. Um, and so what I'd like to ask the community here, I'm not very familiar with the IPs, I'm not really familiar with what we do as a community the formal way, I'm really used to building with the musicians on the ground. I don't know if we need any IP for like proper music metadata for us to get aligned. I don't know if we just need to talk with the Zoras to properly plug in the music metadata render into the Zora stack so that musicians can use it. Maybe it's just me writing an EIP with Hi-Fi Labs and getting it plugged in there. There's a lot of different ways we can propagate this meme out in the ecosystem. I don't really know what to do and I'm not gonna claim that I'm like the king of all this. I just would like to have the conversation more. Um, and so I'd like to ask for help in propagating these music metadata memes so that we can help musicians adopt this technology so that musicians can start leveraging these Web3 rails that make us and the technology that we love so powerful and groundbreaking and like fundamentally changing the world that we know and love. That's it. Viva la musica. These are all the music NFTs that uh, I showed throughout. And then these are a lot of musicians that are based in Argentina and Buenos Aires in Argentina as well as Colombia that I work with on a regular basis. And so if you want to talk to some musicians that are based here in Latin America and you want to like get their thoughts or help them out or talk to them about the music NFTs that they're making, I've attached all their Twitter handles above. So please reach out to them. They are the people that are on the ground doing this. I am just some random engineer that's up here talking to y'all. So uh, with that, we've still got 10 minutes. So I kind of zoomed through that. I will leave the rest of the time open to any questions from the community.
Thank you, Sweetman. Hand of applause. So, do we have any questions in the audience? Raise your hand if you have any questions. Yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering, like, uh, how, what was your process in navigating to, to the EIP? Like, how did you gather information about, like, music metadata is a very complex structure, right? Like, uh, and there's uh, not having consensus over metadata just sounds like a classic music industry, to be honest. Uh, so I was wondering, like, how was your process to getting to the, the uh, this stage and the EIP generally? To be clear, there is no EIP right now. This is this is a bunch of blank data. I copied EIP. <laughs> I took a screenshot of EIP 721 and I blanked out the data to just kind of like put the meme in your head as something that we can do. I don't question back to you. Do you think this is something we could do with an EIP, or does this feel like you say like the music industry is too decentralized for us to come up with an EIP for a music metadata standard? I think yes. Uh, there is one part that's probably uh, up for uh, like off-chain versus on-chain. I think if you have that perimeter very clearly, uh, I think this is this is exciting. Yeah. And, and an attribute I didn't talk about: all of these, uh, all of these decent NFTs, 100% of the metadata is on-chain. So one of the awesome parts about L2s is it's incredibly cheap to store all metadata on-chain, and so we can store that entire music metadata on-chain for less than a penny. And so musicians that are based in Latin America cannot afford to do transactions on ETH mainnet. Um, but by offering them these rails to be able to create music metadata, we can also offer them the opportunity to put it fully on chain so that there's no trust needed in APIs like what sound uses or even like the delay you get by uploading to IPFS if you're not using a dedicated gateway. When you store it all on chain, you get that instant availability that you get on Optimism, Arbitrum, Polygon, and the other L2s. Thank you. More? Do we, we have more time for questions? If there are, yes. Um, it, it wasn't clear. Do you want to write an EIP for this, or do you not want to do it? I'm very open to it. I'm I'm here in the community. I my entire life is music NFTs, yeah. and so if the community decides that we want an EIP, I'm about it. Um, I'm I'm very much of the belief that I, I don't I don't want to say like this is the way. I yeah. like hearing, like the, the music metadata standard, I didn't come up with that. That came out of catalog. And I'm just propagating that meme because right. it's, in my opinion, the best meme. Yeah. If you so, no, I, I think um, a great first step would be to publish, like, it seems you've done a lot of research to, to publish that in some written form, maybe in the Ethereum Magicians forum, uh, to just kind of keep it, make it visible and someone else can then maybe pick it up and formalize it in their EIP. That would be very valuable. And I, I want to offer a counter. I don't think that uh, you specifying something and standardizing something would be like imposing your view of things on the world. It's just offering an option, right? Mm -hmm. And whether that's adopted or not depends on, on, the, on the rest, like you've said. But uh, having an option that is uh, there and specified and, and like standardized is extremely powerful. And I don't think it's uh, imposing anything in any way. Thank you. Do you want to take more questions? We have more time. Love to, especially if it's from Dan. Um, hey, um, <clears throat> it's quite funny because uh, obviously I wrote the Bought Music Report yesterday. <laughs> they came out on this subject. Have you not read it yet? I have not. Uh, interesting. Because there's definitely points of conflict between how we're seeing this. Um, and for me, having worked like Rahul has inside the beast, as it were, um, one of the biggest issues in the music industry comes around multi-party consensus around data points and also conflicts. And that's always been my hesitance about putting everything on chain um, because it, it makes things much more complicated to, and it also um, creates friction around how much you can actually trust something versus if it's housed somewhere else in some kind of on-chain registry um, that can be updated by multi-parties. And so that's why my feeling on this has always been that music NFT data should be minimally viable um, and contextual rich data should be kept elsewhere, but in a fair way, if that makes sense. So just interesting what you think about that. What are your thoughts on the, um, the metadata render architecture that Zora's put out where the creator is able to, there's a trusted party, um, a role that is able to go back in and update that metadata when they choose, does, does that make a difference or you still think the best solution is fully off-chain? Well, <clears throat> who decides who the trusted party is? The creator. If, but what if there's multiple creators? 
I'm excited to hear Columbo's talk on that. Yeah. This is the challenge, right? And then you've got different writers, you've got writers, publishers, uh, producers, um, all these people who are part of this rich soup of um, influence that creates a piece of art. Right, at the moment, in music NFTs, we're in a pretty nice place in that it's usually been one person putting something out. Um, but shit gets complicated as soon as that, <laughs> that expands, right? Um, and I think like it's really important that as we're thinking through this, we need to be, you know, thinking for like mass adoption and, and how to do all that. Point well taken. Nice. We uh, yeah. If you are taking more questions, we have two more minutes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Tranky. Um, this is more just a comment about whether or not you want to do like an EIP or something. I was in a talk yesterday that was like C something called like C A I P. It was kind of over my head. I'm not gonna lie. Yep. Like Cap Ten, but it was a different type of like improvement proposal, sort of like coalition about stuff related to like L2s and things um, and, and addresses. So it could be they have a, the GitHub that's like set up. So I think an initial interesting step could just be fork their GitHub and turn it into like a music metadata IP thing, MMIP or something, I don't know. But yeah, just a suggestion. Yes, so here's the catalog standard um, and you're talking about Cap19 is like cross-chain assets. In here, we have references to other uh, types of assets. And so you'll see in fields like artwork, you have a URI and a MIME type, which is very normal. But then you also have this NFT field, which can link to other NFTs. And that follows the Cap19 standard of cross-chain. So you can actually link different NFTs. If, like, for example, all the NFTs I just made from Sagrado are derivative NFTs of an original NFT. I did not link the original NFT and that's a downside on me and I'm gonna publicly say that like I could obviously do better, but the standard is already up to date so that if we want to link other assets within our NFTs, we can. And so when we're thinking about composing NFTs as music that's built on top of stems or music that's built on top of other music or a remix that's built on top of music that's built on top of stems, the metadata can link back to those underlying works so that we can always be pointing the credit back to those original users. Did I miss the point of your question? I heard cap 19 and I wanted to show this. Mainly referring to the structure they have like on GitHub for like organizing community like input. So I think just like forking the GitHub they have would be a great place to start if you were trying to like start the process of figuring out how to like, you know, just like coordinate between a lot of people. Forking their repo seems like a good place to start. Just to start housing that information in some place. Thank you, Tranky. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Uh, we don't have more time. So thank you very much, Sweetman. And uh, next up is Andres, and uh, we are staying actually in music, and now we are talking about um, the Web3 uh, music multiplayer problem, so, and I'm very excited about that talk as well. Thanks. Uh, not a lot of experience presenting, but um, uh, here we are. So uh, we started off a few months ago uh, in the Water and Music DAO researching about splits and um, we basically got two three main conclusions some of them are very obvious some probably not that much one is that a uh, blockchains can serve as a a login as a log of information and hopefully looking to the future even like a global jurisdiction notary system with a legal validation the second one is that a uh, blockchains have uh, the, the the blockchain architecture is uh, based on a single a singular point of uh, connection or entry for the user, and the third one is that a uh, splits protocols as we understand them in blockchain are focused on distribution of funds, but us creators think about splits more on ownership than really. A, about a, it being a financial. So what is the problem? The problem is copyright, right? We all know a, it's the problem and it is the solution. And copyright law has been used and has been abused, uh, but it's still the only uh, 
or the, or the most widely used form of monetization of intellectual property, right? And if we're looking to the future, where each time we have less and less uh, jobs available, we have a growing creator class, we need to keep copyright as one of those essential uh, ways of monetization for creators. And the, the, the copyright industry is, big, is played with, with problems, but to narrow them down, it is mainly a human problem like it always is. And it is that people do not register their intellectual property as close to the moment of genesis as possible, which is actually the, the, the best way to protect intellectual property. And um, so, and this is maybe because creators think that registering a, or then speaking about legal aspects in the moment of creation kills the vibe. So uh, uh, that actually gives birth to a lot of problems. I like I've been up, uh, you know, like I've had problems with uh, uh, processes in which I have been in the studio. I'm a music producer, so I have been in the studio. Uh, we've made a hit song. Everybody's super excited, right? The pr the process as it is done, it is that um, uh, at least in music. Creators get together in a studio and uh, they songwrite, they beat make, they record, and then they, f they bounce off the audio program, which is a, a WAV file or an MP3. And then that MP3 gets shared among the, the co-creators and uh, it's either emailed to us or it's uh, WhatsApp and, and we can listen to the music or the, what we made and vibe to it. And... Uh, hopefully the next day know if what we did was whack or if it's a hit record, right? Um, so, personally, I have been in those situations and I have been muscled out or cut out of hit records because the more savvy people will uh, head out and register the, the copyright of the song. And uh, this is a story that kind of like repeats itself endlessly. In, um, in music making. So what would the ideal process be? The ideal process would be, would, would be to register, to have a mechanism to register the IP as soon as possible, right? In a nutshell, uh, in a nutshell, uh, it would protect the creators and hopefully in consensus, be able to register this IP in consensus, right? So. Uh, we have a solution, right? We have temp temporarily called it a copyright wallet. And a copyright wallet uh, allows, it's a tool, basically it's a tool that is inserted in the job to be done. It's a, you know, like a small sharp tool that is inserted in a job to be done process and it allows for, in multiplayer mode, deploying a registry time stamping a registry on the blockchain of that intellectual property. So this is design coming from a musician, right? But in essence, what it is, is a, an application, an extension, uh, an extension app that would uh, register the title of the song, let's say in this case, the ownership sp splits of the participants and a mechanism to drag and drop the media. The same way the, uh, a, 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 a chat would, you know, like uh, have access to, to uh, listening to a voicemail or, or a shared audio, the mobile wallets of the participants would receive that audio and they would receive a notification to accept or deny their participation in the in the in that creative process and if there is consensus then a smart contract is deployed and the non-transferable nft is minted as registry so and before we go to future iterations i would like to obviously uh, i think this is time better spent if we if we open up uh, discussions because I mean this could be a, a tool that uh, 
obviously expand and is composed on, but I would like to basically just open the floor to questions to see if, uh, if, uh, a, if we can get to a, a technical solution because the question that, like the questions that we have is, and the main question we have is, does this really need to be a wallet or can it be a, can it be a built in a simpler way? So, thank you, Andres. Um, do we have questions, feedback? Raise your hand, please. Yes. I see you. Thanks. Um, maybe we could go back to the previous slide. I just had a question about like what you're saying in ownership splits, uh, and it's kind of related to what you were saying, where like ownership splits are more than just like who's getting what percentage of like mint revenue or something like that. It's much more. So when you're in that top left corner, when you say ownership splits, are you already like envisioning this, like breaking down into like mechanical and like publishing royalties or are you trying to not necessarily be skeuomorphic and instead do other types of ownership splits or what's, what's the idea here? I, I guess a, a greater question that just how much of the current music industry are we trying to recreate on chain versus maybe moving to stuff that's better in some way. Not that I even know what's better, but yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And the, and the answer would be a, either we, mm, one, of, one of two answers. I'm guessing the, the dynamics, uh, the current dynamics are more of like you songwrite and you fixate on a, on a recording immediately, right? Just because the tools are available. So people are not writing songs with their guitar but they just fix like they just record them immediately and that is just because we have the tools to do it uh, unlike before we used to like write sheet music or or write song uh, uh, lyrics on paper uh, so but the but i guess the the answer to that would be we could either do, do two registries or just split uh, percentages because at the same time you know, like writing and mastering is basically a master, like or like recording is like a 50-50 endeavor, right? So we could um, split from just one big chunk of 100% of ownership or mint, you know, specifics. Any more feedback? We have more time. Yes. So is, is the biggest reason we want it to be a wallet so that we can have that kind of signature-based approval? Like, like the question from Dan in the last talk of um, deciding when the metadata would get to be updated or if a piece of work can be included into a movie or if the rights could be included, like you have that signature step from each of the participants. Is that the reason kind of thinking of it as a wallet or what, what's the reason uh, to have a wallet be the mechanism for controlling the rights? So that is one reason, uh, and the other reason is, and this is very personal, you know, like looking into the future, what I think that would happen or would, would happen or would make sense if it would happen is that this contract is like the master contract of all the IP that is derivative from this original registry. So from this original registry, and we spoke about it briefly on Twitter, uh, we could also have some form of progress NFTs where everybody is, for example, we go into the studio and then we, somebody's going to come and feature on a song, right? That it was not, he was not, a, or she was not in the studio on the, on the first day of the recording. Then we, there's a way of tracking the progress of the intellectual property. Obviously you could go like even deeper with a content ID a mechanisms and whatnot. But I, but I think that this smart contract would probably evolve to be like the master contract where you would mint the one of one of the song or the 10 editions of a, the, the video and all the derivative works and the crew all the value in one contract, basically. Hey, um, something I'm really interested in is using time as a constraint to force kind of consensus between a group. Um, and this feels like it could be quite a good, that could be quite an interesting thing to bring into this. 
that, I actually wrote something about this in like February or something um, about uh, making multi-sig wallets in a similar sort of way. But when I was when I did that design, I was I proposed that you have like a time period that can be defined in which data can change, and at that point it's finalized, and boom, it goes, and that's that. How, how do you feel about that in terms of like the this workflow? Like, um, you know, do you see that you've got multiple parties kind of putting their information in? Do you think that that should be locked down at a certain point, or or how, how are you thinking about time as a concept within uh, within this kind of formalization? I think Dan, I think the the ideal scenario is that creatives get agree on percentages of ownership immediately. I wish, right? Yeah. We wish. But if the tool is available, that might be an incentive, right? And if we fulfill the promise of value through these a uh, specific type of um, a creative products, then we might be able to take it a step further because right, you know like 20 years ago Split, like splits were non-existent. Basically, publishers and record labels were the ones actually doing the paperwork. But it has evolved in the creative mind that they own their their their, their creations and that they want to be a part of split. So more and more, you see like producers and artists and songwriters be like, okay, like let's you know like let's show me the splits, right? Or let's negotiate the splits. Hopefully, as soon as possible. Uh, and this is kind of just like inserting it in that moment of you bounce the song. You share it. Is there consensus? How do we? How are we? You know, like splitting the ownership of this. Let's log it on the blockchain, and um, and it should serve as a proof of work in case there's like legal challenges on 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 the process. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So I understand this. Um, or I, my mind tries to abstract this like um, the concept of self-sovereignty in intellectual property. Um, but then I see this like conflict between the existing structures and the structures, the social structures basically and standards that would have to evolve if this were to actually come and have any chance at becoming like the dominant form of, of um, you know, managing um, creative IP. Um, I'm wondering how you see like the end game of this playing out. How, how can this actually um, win out over the structures that we have right now, which are very strong power structures? Well, the, <laughs> the grand idea would be to finally have a global copyright database, right? If that makes sense. It has been tried several times. I know a lot of people are accepting to that, or I don't know if it if it even is a good idea. But um, a but there has been efforts in you know like sent, like just sharing the information. But the power struggle between comp corporation makes it makes it impossible, right? They don't want to uh, uh, just. Um, a, have that be one uh, entity, and um, and that's that, and that's where the efforts have died. Is it good or is it bad? I don't know. I mean, a, probably haven't thought about the, the 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 consequences, but just transparency on data, I think, should be publicly available and should be, um, you know, like uh, just like a public good. No? Last question. Thank you. Um, are these splits renegotiable at a certain period after a set time? Um, what does that look like? What's the current kind of discourse regarding that? Yes. So copyright law actually states that your right in of on an idea is immutable. Nobody can take that away from you. So a uh, hypnosis can buy the the Bruce Springsteen catalog, but you know, like Merck could never say he sang those songs, right? Even though he he owns the financial exploitation of of the IP. So, uh, and that's like a like maybe a stupid example, but uh, having the possibility of making like the immutable, having the immutable record of you were there, even though you might see the financial retribution of that IP, you have the right to be credited as the author. 
Thank you, thank you, Andre. Uh, thank you for the talk. I think I really liked uh, what you. <laughs> there was like this one quote that you said, like copyright is immutable. That uh, is definitely something I think we can uh, probably all take home and think about for a while. Uh, next up is uh, Ian, uh, and uh, Ian is going to talk about rich content type types in uh, NFTs. And uh, yeah, if you are new here, basically what we are doing is the ERC Lightning Talks. We are the ETH magicians and we are talking about Ethereum request for comments proposals. So not the core dev consensus layer stuff, but the um, solidity interfaces application, um, like these standards. Um, yeah. So uh, thanks for having me, Tim. It was wild. We met at ETH, uh, ETH Berlin a while back and to see you back in the space. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give a quick talk on canonical media and EIP content type. So the notes are basically, I'm just going to flip through JSON and talk about it. Uh, the notes in JSON are on GitHub. If you have questions beyond the talk or you're watching it recorded, make a GitHub issue. Probably the easiest way to respond. And I'm just going to open a conversation about kind of what we've done previously as an organization at Zora, what I've done personally for certain NFT projects, and rendering. So if you go to the original EIP 721, the metadata schema is pretty lightweight. You have a name, description, and image. It was designed in the era of CryptoPunks, CryptoKitties, where you tracked ownership. And the image just kind of showed a cute item or like the thing and then that became more and more important with time. Um, I think it was left pretty open-ended for people to build out from here and I do like that idea of a very minimal standard and then people can run with it but I think at some point that standard can also be improved. So an example is and I've had coworkers ask me this all the time most recently somebody asked how do I make a presentation and the easiest thing to do would be to export your keynote or Figma as a PDF and then mint it, right? Well, unfortunately, the metadata standard just says image. So what people have done, OpenSea kind of added animation URL to show an animation, which could be a web page, GLTF, um, audio, a bunch of random grab bag of content. And the great part about an image is if you want to render it as a consumer, you just pop it into an HTML image tag or you put it in an image viewer. Images are pretty well defined on how to render. Animations get a lot more complex. What we could do is we could convert the presentation into an HTML viewer and upload the HTML viewer. That becomes pretty cumbersome and a little bit difficult because the original content is the PDF. It's not the HTML viewer. And the way Zora approached this with the Zora protocol in 2020 that I didn't really work on that was before my time was to separate this concept of metadata and content. Content was one thing, metadata was another. And the idea here is that the NFT represents you own a particular ID and that particular ID represents a canonical off-chain content. So I highly recommended to use IPFS, which is a decentralized distribution layer, but as a future proofing, also used a hash function, SHA-256, which fits really well into a standard Solidity data type. The Zora Core V0 Solidity has a function for the token URI, which is not the metadata as the standard defines, it breaks the standard, but is actually the canonical content. So if we were to mint a presentation, it would be the PDF, and then the metadata is defined also incredibly simply as name, description, mime type, and version. The mime type is useful for rendering. As I said, you need to have some idea of what you're going to render before, and fetching it from the server just to figure out what the mime type is, is a little bit frustrating. So this here calls the token URI, it returns a IPFS file, um, and then here that file is just text of these two icons. The token metadata URI is name, description, mime type, text plane. So that tells the Zora platform to render a text plane image of that per a text plane of that NFT. And I don't think there have been a lot of platforms that support this. So when you try to look at it on OpenSea, good luck. Um, and that brings me to my next point of thinking about going back in computing history of what people have done to solve this problem. This is a multi-part form data. It's used for email kind of, and used when you upload files in a classic web form. It has content type and it has a certain set of attachments. You can kind of think of this as an email attachment. So I think having content type is quite important. 
Content length, maybe. We can talk about that a little bit later. And then the body of that exact content. Here you have an example. Um, sorry, got out of the way. So an example of what we could do is add a new field to the metadata standard, either through a secondary proposal mechanism or the EIP standard that represents what we just talked about. And there's a lot of details here to unpack. So one of them is maybe you'll want to include the content directly. Should it be body or should it be encoded in a data URI? In that case, the content type is redundant, but when you have an external pinned file, you really want that content type for rendering. It just makes life so much easier from a platform and indexing standpoint. If you have a really obscure file type, let's say somebody loves to upload Illustrator files, you could use an indexer to find every Illustrator file with a very simple content standard. And I think the idea here is you have a token ID represented by a file, and the metadata describes what that file is, but that file, when you need to have a file with your NFT, is the highest resolution, the most um, the highest resolution, the most well-known version of that. An example is Zora was um, brought on to work with the Warhol Foundation to mint one of the original computer NFTs. And it was made on an Amiga with a beta version of software. And art collectors were really frustrated that the NFT was a TIFF file. But it was built with the Zora protocol, meaning it did support TIFF files. However, nobody else did. So what we had to end up doing is use the external URL, which is an OpenSea extension to link to something, to link to the TIFF, and then switch the image URI to become a PNG that renders everywhere. And this is after back and forth with conservationists and with different protocols as to what they expect the NFT to be. Now, if we were to use the content standard, we could define the image that renders as a preview with IPFS, and then we could use the Amica mime type or just a binary blob with some notes around it in the description to refer to the original media. And I think that would help um, conservationists feel better that the NFT is representing what it really represents and not needed to be converted into a new format to be an NFT. A second example of this is Mirror. So if you were to mint a Mirror Marketplace essay, this is what it shows. It just shows a cover image of the text of the title, a description which is a link to Mirror, and that's it. I think there might be like the author information in the properties. But it would be really cool if Quixotic has a relationship with Mirror and they could download the canonical markdown file and start rendering it on their site or at least say, hey, there's a canonical markdown file associated with this. And like GitHub, it would just open a markdown viewer if it understood it. And we can take a look at the JSON here. So if Mirror currently, what they have is they have a content field. And it goes to an RWE file, which is a custom content type they defined. It's quite rich, has a lot of information, but it has the body, the author information, signature information, and stuff they use to run their platform. The problem is, is if we're coming at this from a perspective of an indexer, this is not very helpful. We could try to expand that content field, but that could be any file type. As I said before, it could be some binary blob, or it actually could be useful JSON. So if it's defined as JSON, or maybe an extension to JSON, um, you could use that. But the idea here is it would be the markdown. And if Mirror has extra information, they could use their own fields to refer to that information within the content file or outside. There's a way you can actually add JSON headers to markdown files. So, you know, the file itself as an abstraction is really powerful in this case. But if you were to rewrite this using content, you could use text markdown and then Quixotic could easily parse that, not just from Mirror, but from Zora tools if somebody were to mint a markdown file. And this has happened before when Matthew Ball wanted to mint his original Metaverse essay on Zora. But we wanted compatibility with more marketplaces, and we wanted parts of the metadata to be fully on-chain. The Solidity contract renders the metadata JSON on-chain, but it links to an HTML file of the markdown content, because that's what animation URL supports. So we're having to change the media type into something that fits within an NFT. An easy way to avoid that, and also, if you look at it on OpenSea, it doesn't properly parse an animation URI with an IPFS colon slash slash right now, 
but you can see the metadata is getting loaded in. But the SA experience being a tiny box is really frustrating and links don't work for security reasons. Here it's slightly better, but also links don't work due to security reasons. The sandboxing on an iframe is actually pretty difficult to work with. If this were a markdown file, you could just run it through whatever markdown renderer or even provide a link and just show the preview image associated with the NFT. A final example of this is the dead ringers. Um, it is a part of the ringers art blocks collection and it is a follow up limited time edition where funds went to charity and it was a very large SVG, megabytes and megabytes SVG. And I believe Manifold helped with the mint. And the original file for image was an SVG, but that SVG um, broke wallets and people were not happy because an SVG is text. And for you to encode text, you actually have to turn the SVG into some sort of bitmap format and then convert it again and resize it. So it's really difficult to resize an SVG and most marketplaces pass through the SVG, but this particular SVG was so large it started breaking stuff. So what they had to do is they actually had to update that and change the image to a PNG that did render well, but it was a 12, 21,000 by 43,000 pixel PNG, which also caused some problems. Um, because marketplaces take in the PNG or whatever image file, resize it to a reasonable size and display it. So what we could do now with this particular proposed standard would be to include the optimized image that renders well within marketplaces and then have the canonical content be the super high resolution file the artist intended. So if you own that NFT or wish to display it, you can then download that original file and work with it as you will. And if you were to take the content type, you could then encode the image SVG XML and then a URI, and then optionally include a SHA-256. If you're using Airweave, that's actually a really nice way of verifying that the file is what it is because Airweave doesn't use content addressable hash. So the, the link to IPFS for every file is unique per file, but for Airweave it's different. So the idea here is the SHA-256 is a really standard way for a very long time of verifying that a file matches a file and can be included in this. So overall, the idea of this proposal is to add in a content field and the idea with content is it's quite simple. It doesn't have any underscores. And it's the first time I think there's going to be some proposal or thought process around creating nested structures in the metadata. But I think it's quite useful because content underscore type content, it just doesn't, like we already have JSON, we can nest this. Um, but type URI, SHA-256, and potentially, potentially body for those that want to directly put plain text in. But I feel like uh, URI encoding is also usually a fine option. And I'd love to hear what different creators of standards or media have. Another thought was you could have some sort of attachments associated. Say you have an image that a product you're selling as an NFT and you have a slideshow. Um, I recently worked with the team to show a product and the slideshow had five images. You could theoretically include those as attachments in your um, and then that would be rendered as like a generic attachment on media. I think that's a little out of the scope for this project though. And I would like to kind of focus on, um, I would like to focus on this idea of a single canonical file instead of a set of files, because it makes sense to have a single file and a single NFT ID relate to each other and to not really focus on banners and colors and multiple sizes kind of on the side of open graph where you have this media, how do you render it well on a marketplace or in another context? I think that's out of scope for this particular focus. Um, and the meaning of canonical is to have a standard or primary authoritative body on a subject. So the URL is the authoritative idea of what that NFT is and it's left up to interpretation of the creator or the platform to figure out how to best express that and use it. My open questions are, should this be an EIP? Within the Ethereum Magicians group chat, that's a pretty widely debated topic of metadata is included in the original proposal, but it's not really defined beyond that, and it's defined quite loosely. So one thing I like to do is try to stick to proposals, and I'll typically use the key properties instead of 
whatever has been defined otherwise because it's in the 1155 spec. But I am mixing the 1155 spec with the 721 spec. The non, yeah, and then multiple files, just an open question. So I'm going to wrap up. If you're interested in asking questions from the recording or want to continue the discussion, um, I have a GitHub of these files, and this is my Twitter. I'll zoom in a little bit. And then the one last thing is there was an on-chain version of this EIP content type that used MIME content URI and hash, and this is kind of the inspiration for the off-chain version of this proposal. On-chain, the idea is if you have dynamically generated SVG, it's more composable, it's easier just to return a struct. But I think now kind of working on more projects and kind of finding more examples, the off-chain example is more compelling, and you can still generate a JSON blob on-chain, including the content field. So it kind of works both ways. I just think this is a better start to the approach, a uh, way to approach this project than including a new getter function as an EIP within the Solidity world. This is all off-chain metadata um, we're talking about. I have a little bit of time, so be glad to open it up for questions. Yes, thank you, Ian. Thank you. A round of applause. We have one question. Hi, I'm Marcus. Nice to meet you. Um, if this was implemented as an e EIP, what do you think the second and third order effects of this would be? I hope the very first um, thing is indexers pro platforms would include it in minting. So Manifold actually does really try hard to include a lot of metadata. They do image, image underscore URL. Image includes the hash and the URL and the content type and some other data. So I think kind of syncing with them to figure out what their needs are. But once you start having stuff minted in this format, I think it's gonna hit indexers. And then once indexers can understand this, people can say, oh, I can upload Illustrator files. I can upload um, WebGL shaders. I can upload some binary form, like you can actually now mint a Solidity contract. And when somebody buys it, they'll feel more assured that they're actually buying a Solidity contract rather than somebody, say, or the file of a Solidity contract, rather than somebody saying, oh, here is a Solidity contract. And what I typically have advised creators to do is actually explain it and link in the description the IPFS URL of the canonical media. It's hacky, but it seems to have worked. Um, and that would kind of remove that and allow for users to see like a link. And I've seen artists on Twitter talking about using unlockable media in OpenSea to include the source files. And if the artist is comfortable, they could just include the source files and it would be a link or some sort of description on plat marketplaces. And since this is relatively easy to implement, once a few start, I think it would start spreading. Yeah. Thank you. We have another one here. Thank you. Hi, hello. Congrats for the project. Um, so content type is a response header on HTTP, right? Um, thinking about you know the second order effects, um, have you thought or worked on uh, the request headers equivalent, like the accept, and then having some specific wildcards such as text slash and then wildcard? So the one problem when you're indexing is that a lot of times IPFS is really slow. People's servers go down. Um, if you're able to get the metadata on the client, a lot of people hot link directly to an IPFS gateway. And pulling the content type out of the headers really allows for a better set of expectations when you're indexing and rendering the NFT. But your question is to kind of use the HTTP response conversation to define the MIME type rather than put it in the metadata? Yeah, sure. So there is the uh, content negotiation yeah. uh, step, right? So and then you have from the uh, accept um, request header. Yeah. And more often uh, you have like some sort of wildcard there. Right. So that can help, uh, you know, more generic applications to accept, let's say, image slash column, uh, slash uh, wildcard, something. So I think a lot of the off, off off-chain NFTs go through a decentralized gateway provider, and those gateway providers are not very, like you're out, the control of the server retrieving decentralized media is out of the control of the user in most cases. So you can't rely on a server negotiation. You're thinking of a world maybe where 
there's a server that is connected to the URI of the NFT, and that's becoming a lot less common because that means you're now having a centralized point of failure. So the idea here is if you put it in the JSON, there at least be some intentionality if you're on some weird version of IPFS like Node that doesn't understand the media it's serving or there's a bug in it, you'll still have something that kind of works or have an expectation of what the original intention was. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Maybe one last question. Okay, otherwise, ah, yes, okay. We have one. Here you define the um, um, content type inside the JSON um, to like save some uploads. Could you define the data in the collection as well? That's actually a great question that I didn't have time to address, but Mirror and Zora and a few other platforms have additions. And I think utilizing a singular NFT metadata in the contract URI, which is an OpenSea extension, is a really effective way to handle that. And right now, um, I know most platforms that do additions support the contract URI. So for Dead Ringers and for um, Zora editions, the contract URI is actually generated on chain and sometimes we'll put in IPFS depending on how big the content is. And that includes image and includes animation if every single thing in the collection is the same. And we use that internally in our infrastructure to give a preview if there's no mints yet or like what that whole collection is supposed to be. There's no standard around it, but this would also slot quite well within the contract metadata. If you wanted to have a canonical contract um, content field, it should just work. Thank you, Ian. Round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next up is Francisco from uh, OpenSea, thank you, um, which is going to speak about EIP 5267. And uh, I have been saying the entire time that it's, a, it's uh, about the domain separator. So, yeah, okay, gladly. Uh, um, yeah, so sorry, we're going to move on from NFTs now. Um, it's going to be about ERC20s, which are boring now, but okay. Um, I'm, a correction, I'm not from OpenSea. I work oh. at Open Zeppelin, uh, op maintain and develop Open Zeppelin okay. contracts, which obviously uh, maintains uh, many ERC implementations. And so um, this is a really important topic to me. Um, so this EIP that I'm going to be talking about is really quite tiny. Um, but I want to use it more as an excuse, maybe, to talk about the process of building an EIP and what the, the kind of steps that I think uh, one should follow. So, because like EIP one, which it's not here, but maybe you've all seen it, kind of defines the series of stages like draft, review, last call, and final. But it doesn't really say what should happen in each of those stages. So I want to share how I personally am thinking about that as I develop um, an EIP. Uh, yeah, so the problem at hand here is the ERC-20 permits. Uh, anyone that has used a AMM, a decentralized exchange before, knows that in order to do a token exchange, you need to um, approve first and then transfer. And this EIP permit um, is one way of uh, foregoing the initial approved transaction and replacing it with a signature that allow you to, allows you to do it all in just one transaction by just including the signature in the first transaction. So um, this saves gas. It uh, is one less transaction uh, and uh, it uses the signature instead. But it's kind of weird if you use an, ex an exchange or an aggregator you don't really see this being used very often. Um, I think uh, main, maybe it's just for like USDC uh, exchanges support it, but there are many other tokens that have this and don't. So the question that was in the back of my mind is like, why is this? Uh, why is that uh, so weird? So <clears throat> the this EIP underneath uses uh, this other EIP, 712, which is a special kind of signature. Um, it's a signature not of a blob, which is what we see uh, often, uh, most, most usually, um, but of a kind of typed data structure. So it's kind of important because it allows you to get more structure to it. Uh, in the case of permit, you will include the amount that you're allowing. Um, you will include an expires, uh, 
timestamp and a nonce and so on. And this is an important uh, standard because wallets can implement support for it and show this structured data to the user in a nice way. One of the important things in this EIP is the notion of a do domains. So when you make an approval for say USDC, you don't want an attacker to take that signature and kind of send it to DAI, right? You don't want an attacker to reuse the signature in a different domain. So every signature has this domain separator inside of it that makes sure that the signature is only valid in one domain. So this is the, um, Right, so the decentralized exchange has no way of knowing, um, given some arbitrary token, what domain they want to use. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that is the reason why this hasn't been really adopted. So you will see that um, the ERC20 permit ERC defines a getter that gives you the hash, but really the uh, 712 RPC endpoint requires the entire domain object and there is really no way to find it here. So this is where uh, EIP 5267 comes in. Um, now we will see now it's a very simple function that literally just allows you to obtain the domain. Uh, this is the domain object that you will need to pass into the 712 uh, sign RPC call. Um, and, and as you can see, like, it's extremely simple. Now, what was also in the back of my mind is that this, was, this is not also a failure of the spec, uh, 12, uh, 2612, so permits, but it was also in a way a failure of the process because if the 2612 authors had kind of gone all the way and kind of talked to decentralized exchanges and thought through uh, what it would entail to adopt that, they would have realized that this was missing. So I didn't only want to tackle the technical problem here, but also think about how can I uh, carry out the process for the CIP to make sure, and, and other ERCs to make sure that the sort of failure of the process doesn't present itself. So the question is, how do we get this now? which is in a review stage, how do we get it now to final? What needs to happen in order to get it to final? So some of the things that I've done um, and that I would recommend you all do when you build your EIPs. Um, so you should reach out to all interested parties and like applications and companies and uh, projects that you think will be using this. And really you should be kind of <laughs> bothering them to give you feedback, to look at it and give you feedback. So I've reached out to uh, OneInch and Uniswap and kind of seen, uh, try to get from them, is this useful to you? Would, is, it, does this solve a real problem for, for you? Um, and generally the answer in this case has been yes. Um, in the uh, Ethereum magician thread, there's also been a couple of interesting comments on common questions. I have taken some of the questions and documented them as part of the EIP as well. Um, and also some concerns that have arised. Uh, so many of those concerns in the case of this EIP were about the backwards compatibility uh, section, which is here. But um, most of the discussion of the Ethereum machine thread made, made me realize that even though I wrote this section and kind of thought about it, there really are many more unanswered questions. So I wanted to do some more work to figure out the real backward compatibility story. So another, th another thing that I've started doing, which I think is a really good exercise, is to implement it, uh, and not only like the solidity part of it, but also the many parts of the stack again. So I've just... <laughs> Uh, started this EIP, uh, repository with the implementation and most importantly a little app which is just a front-end app which is what I imagine that a decentralized exchange will kind of be doing behind the scenes and here I'm putting myself in the shoes of I am the UI for one inch and this is what I'm going to be doing uh, and just kind of really figuring out if it works if I can actually produce the signatures that they will need to produce, um, and also to use this to figure out the backwards compatibility story. And um, I still need to develop this a little bit further, but I'm hoping that I'm gonna come up with a, a good and kind of 
a comprehensive answer, then I can then go back in the EIP and document it there um, to make sure that it really answers the concerns that were raised in the Ethereum magician's thread. So I think, uh, yeah, that's it. Um, again, it was very quick, but uh, these are some of the um, things that I've been experimenting with in order to get this to a final stage. Um, I think uh, there are, well, we see many EIPs that take more of a fast track uh, and get to a final stage, which is, you know, it's better in a way because uh, we know that these processes can be long and it's really annoying. But um, then you get to a final stage and uh, it doesn't necessarily mean anything and it ha if it hasn't been thoroughly tested. And then you're really going to run into some issues when, say, Open Zeppelin implements it and people start deploying it and you realize, oh, fuck, this, this isn't really enough. Um, so um, then you need to start thinking about like a follow-up EIP and it's all uh, really much more complicated than it should be if we do things better before we get to a final stage. So anyway, those are some of my ideas. Thank you. Um, happy to take questions, if any. Yes, thank you very much. Do we have questions? Yes. Hey, really cool. Uh, first uh, comment, it, it reminds me of uh, like the Amazon six page written narrative way of you have to like sharpen your point or your case and then you go around and get feedback from people and then incorporate that in a fact at the end of the document yeah. to like, cause you know other people have those concerns or objections. Yeah. So that's really awesome. Um, do you, can you just speak a little bit more about that process and how you followed up with people maybe on this one or something in the past? So it's one thing for somebody to say it looks great, maybe give some feedback on the Ethereum magician's post, but really an EIP's success or failure is like people using it like you just spoke to. So have, do you have a good example of like following back up with protocols and actually getting them to implement the EIP uh, as part of your uh, kind of biz dev work, if you call it? Yeah, so uh, good question. I haven't thought about that too much yet, um, but um, one of the things that I, I personally struggle with is that I, I feel like I'm in a bit of a uh, conflict of interest position because of being an open Zeppelin contracts maintainer. It's like, it's gonna be really easy for me to put this in the contracts and make people use it, but I don't wanna force it down people. So um, for example, one thing that I uh, could do and now that I'm thinking about, it, I think it would be a great idea is to talk to this uh, one inch uh, developer that I talked about and um, maybe uh, try to get them to, to uh, walk me through, do they really see the, so they like really see themselves implementing this and maybe what is the timeline um, and kind of, yeah, just trying to get more concrete data on, on their plans and try to try to get them to commit. Um, maybe that's what I, I would do. Thank you. Uh, more questions, feedback, maybe uh, people that have used this or, or uh, 712. Raise your hand if you have a question. Okay. Then thank you very much, Francisco. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and that's essentially it. That was the ERC Lightning Talks from the Magicians. I hope you all liked it. Um, you can find each and everyone, hopefully, uh, on the Eve Magicians Forum. And I'm looking forward to um, all of the posts that are coming out of uh, these discussions. I'm, I want to uh, thank you all for participating uh, like so much in this conversation. And I, I really appreciate that we were having like a back and forth between the audience and, uh, and the presenters and so on. And yeah, it was great to uh, be able to host this. And yeah, thank you very much and see you around. <laughs>